What an honor to be here today. It's just, uh, it's so neat for me to be able to stand here in this, on this platform and look at you and thank God for what he has do- done. I am, I am so thrilled because I can remember the birth of this church and remember uh, how God began and the faithfulness of your pastor and then to see so many friends that I have known for many years. It's just been great uh, to be able to talk to you for a few minutes, though it has only been a few minutes. It is wonderful to be able to be here in the house of God serving with you this morning. We're going to talk about fatherhood. We're going to talk, in fact, the title of this message this morning is The Father, Our Ignorance example, our example. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. God is our heavenly Father, and He is the one that created everything. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 2, and I want you to see the fatherhood of God. I want you to see what God the Father did for us. The Bible tells us about the creation of man. In Genesis chapter 1, it says in verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So here's the key. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. That's the purpose. That is why God created us. God created all of the animals, created everything on this planet, created the entire physical universe. It's all recorded there in Genesis chapter one. And then when he finished all of creation, he wanted a creature that would represent him. He wanted a creature that, that would be able to represent him in everything and, and to, to, to the uh, physical universe. So he creates man. And he creates man in his image and in his likeness so that we can represent him. The only reason we're on this planet is to, here to make money. You're not here to get famous. You're not here for anything else except to represent God. And as earthly fathers, we should want to represent our heavenly father. So here we see that God creates man. Now, uh, Genesis chapter 1 is God giving the just, just the brief uh, God creates man and created him in his image and in his likeness. Then it go, this story goes on. In Genesis chapter 2, God gives us the details of this creation. So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible says this. It says, and the Lord God took the man and he put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. He gave him a responsibility. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, out of the tree, uh, 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 commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat freely, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. So he gives him some instruction, he gives him some warnings. And then look at this. God gives him a life partner. In verse 18, the Bible says, and the Lord God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I like that verse. That's that's God saying, this boy needs help. (laughs) I've created this thing, and he's wandering around the garden, like, oh, this is nice. And and, and, somebody needs to help that boy. (laughs) And so God creates the woman. And he, 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 before he does that, <laughs> before he does that, he puts Adam to sleep. Or, I'm sorry, before he does that, he says, look, the boy's thick. He's not going to catch on real quick. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have him name all the animals. Now, the animals have already been created. Uh, he creates man in his image and his likeness, but he's all alone. And so he says, look, Adam... You need a help. And I'm saying, yeah, I, do. I need help. He says, so what, what I want you to do is I want you to name every one of the animals. 
And, uh, and so he brings them by, brings them an elephant, and Adam says, let's call it an elephant, but I, I don't want that for a help me. And uh, he brings him a donkey and said, no, I, I don't want the donkey. And he brings him a dog, and dog is not man's best friend. He said, no, I don't want that. He brings him a raccoon. Uh, he brings him uh, every animal that he could bring him, and, and he brings them all the animals. And Adam, he names all of the animals, but the Bible says, look, look down in verse 20. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the, of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an help meet for him. Everybody say, aw, aw. He's all by himself. There's nobody. He's named them all. There's nothing for him. And so the Bible says, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and he closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her to the man. Now, the man has not had a conversation with her. The man has not, um, uh, doesn't know any of her likes or dislikes. Uh, the, the, the man is not emotionally tied in any way but the man wakes up, the Bible says, and Adam said, he brought, he, brought, he brought her to the man, so it's like, Adam, wake up, here's, here's your helpmate. And he wakes up and he looks, and the Bible says, and Adam said, this is now, you see the excitement here? This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Somebody said, we don't know why he, she was called woman. It was probably because he woke up and said, whoa, man, and that's exactly what I want. That's what I've been looking for. Yes, a whole lot better than all those other things. I'll take, I'll take her. And she, she called, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and mother. God says, if you want her, you gotta make a commitment. And shall cleave unto his wife, and she shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. They were totally open with one another. Look, I want you to see this just very quickly. I want you to see that we have a heavenly father who provides for us. He provided a warm, secure home. Fathers, you can't expect to have the respect and the honor of your children unless you're providing for them that warm, caring home. That's what he did. He provided for Adam a warm, caring home. He gave them the privilege of representing him. He gave him a responsibility and a privilege. This is what you're here to do. He then gave him a life partner so that he would not be alone. And I want you to see who this life partner was. This was not, this was a man and a woman. Adam knew what a woman was. He could answer that question. Do you understand? He, he, uh, he said, this is a woman, this is what I want. God did not give Ad Adam another man. You understand that? God did not give Adam, and listen, God did not give Adam two or three women. Can you say amen to that? God said, here it is, one man, here's the plan for the family, no matter what anybody says, ABC, CBS, NBC, the Supreme Court, or the President of the United States. God's plans, God's plan is one man serving one woman for one lifetime. Amen. Can I have a bigger amen than that? Amen. You need to understand that. So God's, God gave him a life partner and, God, and, and, and then he gave him a free will. Why did God put that tree in the midst of the garden? God said, don't eat of the tree of the middle, in the middle of the garden. And they said, where, where is it? Don't eat of that tree. Why did he do that? Why did he do that? Here's why. God wanted man to love him freely. God wanted man to have a free will. And so he said, here, you need to understand, I want you to love me. He gave him a free will to love him. And then he gave him instruction. And he gave him purpose. He said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to tend the garden. I want you to take care of this. And then he said, don't eat of the tree of the, uh, in the middle of the garden. And if you do... That day you're surely going to die. He gave him a warning. He gave him a warning. These are such great principles for parenting. And then he said, 
He, when, when man blew it, he didn't say, you're out of here. You disobeyed. I want nothing to do with you. He gave him a means of reconciliation. The Bible tells us that mankind sinned. Adam sinned. And, and when you and I were born, we were born sinners because we, we inherited that from Adam. And the Bible says because of our sin, none of us deserve to go to heaven. And the Bible says that God loves us in spite of the fact that we're sinners. And he loves us so much that he wants us to go to heaven. But his justice says our sin has to be paid for. And the wages of sin is spiritual death, separation from God forever in hell. God doesn't want you to go to hell. God wants you to go to heaven. And so, but somebody has to pay for your sin. So God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ. And he came to this earth as a man. And he died and paid the penalty of your sin in your place. He was buried. Three days later, he rose from the dead. Was seen by hundreds of eyewitnesses and then went back to heaven. Now the Bible says you and I can go to heaven just by simply coming to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I believe that you are God. I believe that you died for me. I believe you were buried and you rose from the dead for me. And I want to ask you to save me. God the Father promised that reconciliation in Genesis chapter 3. Though you've disobeyed me, I'm going to send somebody who's going to die for your sins and rise from the dead. And he covered him with, with the skins of animals so that he would, they would know that he loved them in spite of their sin. If you've never received Christ, I would encourage you to do that today. He's a heavenly father, a wonderful father. He provided a warm and secure home for his children. Beyond that, I want you to see other things that a father needs to do if he's going to be a father like God the Father. He is our example. I want you to see four things this morning. Number one, I want you to see this, that if you're gonna be the kind of father that God wants you to be, you need to pray for your children every single day. You need to pray for your children. Several years ago, I was doing a missions conference. And in that missions conference, uh, some, it was here in Las Vegas, a lady came up to me after our first session and she said, Pastor, would you do a session tomorrow on how to raise kids? And I said, why? She said, well, I'm looking around here. You've got five kids? They're all loving Jesus. They're all serving Jesus. They're all wanting to do what Jesus wants them to do. And they're serving and they love, they're, they're a pleasure to be here. They love the ministry. How in the world did you do that? Said, That's a good question. She said, would you answer that tomorrow? I said, yeah. I went home and I said to my wife, Anna, how did we do that? <laughs> and we sat down and we wrote, out, we wrote out 13 things that we did to raise our children to want to serve the Lord. I, I, I later put that into a book called Raising God's Kids in Sin City. That, was, that book is available uh, for you today to get it. I'm giving you four points out of that book right now. And the first one is this, pray for your children every single day. Pray for your children every single day. I, I can't overemphasize the importance of prayer. It is so important that you pray for your children. I remember when I... When, uh, when Matthew was only three or four years old and Joshua was only one or two years old, I went to a men's conference at Ironwood Youth Camp. We, we went in and a preacher started talking to us and, and that preacher started telling stories about preacher's kids. And he talked about how preacher's kids go bad. Now, preacher's kids are the worst influence in the, in the church. And he talked about a preacher's kid who, who got off in drunkenness and, and ruined his life with alcohol. And then he talked about another preacher's kid who got involved in drugs and messed up his entire life with drugs and was totally, his life was ruined with drugs. He talked about another preacher's kid who got involved in immorality and talked about that. And man, I'm sitting there thinking as a young preacher, man, I can remember Diana Ross back in the 1960s. She said, the only one that could ever reach me, that was the only one that could get her to be immoral was the sweet talking son of a preacher man. And I thought, oh, this is horrible. And I'm, I'm, I got so burdened. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, this is just terrible. I don't want my kids to grow up not wanting to serve the Lord. And after that meeting was over, my, uh, all the men went off to different game rooms. There was a little patch of grass out in back of the chapel, and there was uh, some benches and some mesquite trees that were growing out. I went out by myself so I could just get alone with God. And I got down on my knees 
And I put my face to the dirt and I said, God, I don't care if anybody ever knows who I am. I don't care if we ever have any money. I don't care if we ever have any ministry at all. I just want my children to live for you. God, I pray for Matthew and I pray for Joshua. I pray they'll live for you and serve you. God, if you just allow my children to grow up and live for you and serve you. God, I, I, it, Father, if they'll just live for you and they'll serve you and they'll honor you, God, then you can take me home. If they'll, they'll just serve you and God, work in their lives. And I started begging God. I don't know if I was down there for 20 minutes or for two hours. I just kept begging God and crying and saying, Lord, I want my kids to serve you. I want my kids to serve you. And I got burdened about the fact that I need to pray for my children every single day. I want to pray that, God, that they'll live for God. I want to pray that they'll serve God. And I want you to understand, I'm not eloquent. I have no eloquent words to say. I'm not fancy about anything. And uh, I, I just want you to understand that. I just, I just want to beg God. So I decided I was going to pray. I was going to pray that my kids would be saved at a young age, that they would live for the Lord and serve him all their lives, and that they would, God would give them a godly wife for Matt and Josh. And then I have five children, Matthew, Joshua, Charity, Faith, and Hope. And I, 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 I decided I was going to pray every day. I made that commitment. I want you to understand this. This morning I woke up. Right now I have 10 children. Five of them were born to us and five of them married into our home. Yes. And I have 19 grandchildren. And I know you're looking at me and saying, how can that be possible? You look younger than Josh. I know you're thinking that. <laughs> but I have 19 grandchildren. And I want you to know that this morning when I woke up at five o'clock, I went into the back room and I prayed for every single one of them by name. I prayed that, that they would be, that if, if they're married, Pray for Josh and Heather that God would bless them. They're traveling, keep them safe. I prayed that, that God would bless them. I prayed that they would live for the Lord and, and that God would prosper them. I prayed for every one of my grandchildren, all 19 of them. I prayed for my oldest granddaughter, my oldest grandson, that's Jonathan, and then Ashlyn's my oldest granddaughter. I prayed for them by name. I prayed, I prayed Ashlyn would, would live for the Lord, serve the Lord, that God would give her a godly husband, and that and that uh, she would serve the Lord all her life. By the way, I have a, a granddaughter named Daisy. Daisy May is tr right at 12 months old. When she sees me on the phone, she says, Grandpa, Grandpa, that's Grandpa. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I love her. I prayed for her today. I prayed, Lord, I prayed for Daisy. Daisy Dawn, I pray that she would live for you and serve you all of her life and that, that you'd give her a godly husband. You said, why are you praying for a godly husband when she's only a year old? Because I don't wanna wait till she's 18 years old and brings home some weirdo, and then I have to pray, God, kill the kid. Kill that kid. Why do you wanna wait for the disaster to happen? Pray ahead of time. Can you say amen to that? Take care of the problem. I call it, I call it pre-pray instead of pre-pay. So start praying. I prayed, I, I prayed for them every single day. Jonathan, Jonathan, when he was eight years old, spent the night at my house. And uh, <laughs> it was time to go to bed. And I said, okay. So we had a room set aside for him and took him in there. I uh, tucked him in and put my hand on his back. I said, I'm gonna pray for you. He said, okay. Put my hand on his back. I said, Lord, I pray for Jonathan. I pray he'll live for you and serve you all of his life. I pray you'll give him a godly wife. And I heard, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> I said, well, you can't interrupt my prayer. I'm praying for you. He said, don't do that. I said, what? He said, I'm not getting married. <laughs> About two months ago, I was talking to Jonathan. I said, you'd still want me not to pray for a wife? No, you can go ahead, Grandpa. <laughs> it's, it's fine. Uh, I prayed for, I pray for him every day. And, and I, I prayed that God would work. I, I, I want God to save my children young and I want my, them to save my grandchildren young and I want them to grow up and live for the Lord. I want, I want them to have godly spouses. And so I pray that. Somebody said, isn't that vain repetition? No, vain repetition means empty repetition. 
God tells us that if you want something, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on find, knocking, and that's what God wants us to do. So just keep on doing that, asking God. But listen, don't just, don't just pray for your children every day. Let your children hear you pray for them every day. I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, listen, again, I'm like you. When I get home at night, I'm exhausted. But I determined I was gonna let my children hear me pray for them. My children think I can get anything from God because they've heard me pray for them. And so th there's a need, they're all married, they're all out doing, but if there's a need, they'll call me and tell me, Dad, pray for this. Because they believe that I believe in prayer. And, and, and they've heard me pray for them. I used to go home, uh, we had a, in our house, there was the, the, the kids' room, the girls' room was over here, and the boys' room was right here. There was a door that went into the boys' room and a, boy that, a, a door that went into the girls' room. And so I would say, hurry up, come on, get, get, get in bed, get in bed, get in bed. And then, I would, then I'd stand between the two doors so they could all hear me. I'd say, you in bed? Bow your heads and close your eyes and I'm gonna pray for you. And then I'd pray, Lord, I pray for Matt and I pray that he'd live for you and serve you all his life and give him a godly wife. And if they asked special prayer requests, uh, like Josh would always say, pray for Freddie, he's a mess. And I'd say, yes, okay. And um, I'd pray for, pray for him. So, so we would, I would pray for them, and then I'd just get through them. And very quickly, and then I'd say, Lord, help us to go to sleep. Help us to sleep well. God, don't let anybody get sick tonight. And, and you say, just like that, that's not much of a prayer. No, it isn't, but my kids heard me pray. So you don't have to be eloquent, but your kids need to hear you asking God to protect them. Do that, pray for your children every day. I gotta tell you this sweet story. My, my Matthew, when he was, uh, Matthew went off to college, graduated, came back, and he was unmarried. I mean, he went to, to Bible college, there's like 4,000 uh, Christian girls there, and he comes home, and I said, what's wrong, son? And uh, he said, he said, now Joshua, on the other hand, like right into it. He said, I found this girl. And I said, don't let her go and don't let her know what she's really like. And Heather stayed with him. Anyway, so, uh, <laughs> but Matthew graduated from college and there was no, and I said, dad, I, I said, Matthew, why aren't, why is there somebody? He said, he said, dad, I know. He said, I'm waiting. He said, he said, what I want to do is I want, I want to, when I see the girl, that God has for me, I want to walk in and look at her and say, wow. I said, well, that's nice. I said, I hope she says, wow, back. <laughs> you know, sometime you're looking for Barbie, but you're not quite Ken. <laughs> you understand that? So I said, I said, you need to, you need to understand. So, so now, Charity is four years younger than, than Matt, and she had a best friend named Brianna. Brianna would come and she would spend the night at our house and everything and because we, and we very seldom let people spend the night at our house because it's a dangerous thing. You understand that kids can stay up longer than you? Do you understand that your wonderful, sweet Christian children can talk about things that they shouldn't be talking about when you're asleep? So we didn't have kids spend the night very often, but Brianna, we knew her, we knew her parents, we knew everything about her, and so every once in a while she would spend the night and so when she would spend the night, she was in the girls' room, I would say, Lord, I pray for Brianna that she'll live for you and serve you all of her life, and, and God, you'll give her a godly husband. Well, Matt goes off to college, comes back, he's working for us at church. It's time for Charity and, and Brianna to go off to college, so they go off to college, and then they come back from college. And... Uh, Charity comes into our living room and everybody's hugging Charity, it's wonderful. And then Brianna walks in. And when Brianna walks in, Matthew turns around and he notices her and he says, whoa. <laughs> that sounded a lot like wow to me. And Brianna never spent the night again. <laughs> and so, so it was about a year and a half later, I got the privilege of marrying Matthew and Brianna. That was a neat thing, really neat thing. Now listen, after we did the wedding, there's the reception line, and I, I walked back, gave Matthew a great big hug, and I went to give Brianna a hug. And as I did, she grabbed my arms and she said, Dad, she said, I, I just want to tell you something. I said, what's that? She said, remember? Remember? 
remember when I used to spend the night with Brianna? I said, yeah. She said, remember when you prayed for Matt that God would give him a godly wife and then you prayed for me that a God would give me a godly husband? She said, you prayed for us twice that night. The sweetest memory I have and I got to hug her. I'm so glad she heard me pray for her. Listen, Dad, I don't care how tired you are, let your children hear you pray for them every single day. Second thing, play with your children. Play with your children. Have fun with your children. When, my, <laughs> when, when, when I wrote this book, Raising God's Kids in, in Sin City, uh, my kids said, hey, we're going to push this on social media. We're going to do this big blog thing, and we're going to do this thing, uh, this, 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 uh, this live broadcast. And all five of my kids are going to do this thing. I said, oh, this is really going to be disastrous. My five children talking about what it's like to be raised in my home. And I thought, so, so they did it. And, they, and, and I, I, I mean, it was a little scary for my wife and I. We didn't watch it for about a year and a half. But then we decided to watch it, and, and, and the thing that impressed me was this, that I kept hearing them talk about, oh, this was fun, and this was fun. Oh, we had, this, we had so much fun doing this, and oh, this was fun, and man, this was fun. And I realized, we made being a Christian and being in ministry fun. They loved the ministry because it was fun. Do you realize that the Christian life is the greatest life in the world? Do you realize that what we have is amazing? When you and I got saved, the Spirit of God came to live inside of us. We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit living inside of us. We know why we are here. We know, we know where we came from. We know where we're going. The world's walking around in darkness. God calls them lost. We have life. And man, we should be showing our children that it's the greatest life in the world. Have fun with your kids. Enjoy having fun with them. I used to plan activities with our kids. I used to, um, we didn't have a lot of money back then, and we had to try and figure out fun things to do. Every Monday we took off with our kids. People would say, uh, you're, you're a pastor, you should be doing that 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I'd, I'd say, yeah, I do. But one day a week I pastor my family, and I'm gonna do that. And so we would take off every Monday. I would be out on Saturday trying to figure out what I was gonna do next Monday. I would be knocking on doors or inviting people to church or visiting, and I'd be out doing that kind of thing. And I'd be thinking, what am I gonna do fun on Monday? What am I gonna do on fun on Monday? One day, I, we were totally broke, and I'm thinking, I gotta do something that they'll really enjoy, and it hit me. I remember when I was a junior age kid, I used to like going lizard hunting. I'm gonna take my kids out lizard hunting. Now Matthew's about 13 years old and Hope is like 18 months old. I used to carry her around like this, like a sack of potatoes. And, and I thought, I'll take them lizard hunting. I go home and I tell my wife, hey, I got something to do Monday. She said, what is it? I said, we're gonna go lizard hunting. She said, what? I said, we're gonna go lizard hunting. She said, out in the desert? I said, yeah, we're gonna go out in the desert. She said, there's snakes out there. I said, honey, there's not gonna be snakes out there. You don't have to worry about that. She said, honey, are you sure? I said, listen, I did this as a little kid all the time. By the way, if you've never gone lizard hunting, you might want some tips, so let me give you, tell you what you do. You get, you get, you get five or six junior age boys, and, you, and what you do is you go out in the desert where people have tra dropped trash, and you'll find pieces of wood, uh, lizards hide under that, or pieces of tin, or pieces of cardboard, they, they hide under there, and what you do is you get four or five guys around that piece of cardboard, and then one of them reaches down, and you, you flip the thing up, and when you see the lizard, everybody jumps on the lizard with their hand, and the hand that gets the lizard, if the lizard survives, gets to keep the lizard. That's, that's the rules, okay, so... I took my kids out. We got in a car. We're driving out in the desert. My wife's saying, are you sure there's not going to be a snake? I don't worry. There's not going to be any snakes. It's going to be fine. I'm just not sure about this. I said, well, it's okay. And so I'm driving down the road. In the, in the middle of the dirt road, there is a, somebody dropped off a box spring. I thought, perfect insulation. This is going to be great. My wife said, anything could be under there. I said, it's okay. I get Matthew over here. I get Joshua over here. I get Charity over here. I get Faith over here. And I got Hope on, on my thing. Anna's 15 foot behind here. She's watching. I told the kids what to do. Be quiet. And as soon as, soon as we open up 
the, uh, as soon as I pick, p- p- pick this up, there's going to be a, a lizard under there. We don't know what kind, but there'll be a lizard under there. So I reach down and I grab, I grab the, the box spring and I flip it up. And when I did, I was right. There was a little snub-nosed lizard right about here that I saw immediately. What I did not see was this three foot rattlesnake that was <laughs> coiled up right here under the blow sand. And I, I reached, I, I, the kids all jumped back. And I, again, I didn't see that. My wife, 15 foot away, this is all in like slow motion to me. David, there's a snake. At that time, I'm reaching down for the little lizard. And as I'm going for the little lizard, the big snake comes up. I took hope. I put her down. She's standing there like this. And the snake is looking at her eyeball to eyeball. Now you're asking, why am I telling you this story? Because I want to emphasize, have fun with your family. (laughs) Play with your children. Build memories. (laughs) By the way, we all survive. So, number three, personally apologize when you're wrong. When you do something that you that you know is wrong. I want you to understand your kids hate hypocrisy. Be genuine. Let them see reality. Now there's some discretion that you need. They need to understand that not everything you do at home you can do at church. There is discretion. But look, let them see that you're real. That you're you're the same person at home as you are at at church. Uh, You're the the same. And 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 uh, uh, and, and personally, when you blow it, when you do something wrong, personally apologize. There was a time that my wife, my wife uh, was having a, a ladies' activity at our church, and she said to all the, uh, she said uh, to us, look, I'm gonna be gone all day this Saturday. Well, that meant it was gonna be party day. So I got this VHS tape. If you're young, you can ask somebody else what a VHS tape is. Anyway, <laughs> I got this VHS tape, and and I said, to my, I said to my kids, we're gonna watch this movie. It was as Superman 4 had just come out and we were gonna watch Superman 4 and I, I got it ready and I, I went out and I got, I got pizza that we were gonna warm up and I got popcorn and it was all ready. It was gonna be a great big party day. It was gonna be great. It was fun, fun time. So Anna gets up, kisses me goodbye. Now, I gotta tell you as a backstory to this, when your pastor, Joshua, was, was like 18 months old, he almost died. He, uh, he, we did not know that he was, had a huge allergy, I mean a very severe allergy to milk and sugar. So when we found that out, we of course didn't allow him to have milk or sugar, and, uh, and so, but we had to do something so that he would have calcium, and so we started giving him and all of the kids, we figured if it was good for him, it's good for everybody, we gave him calcium pills every day. Now calcium pills are wonderful. Uh, they come in citrus flavor, or lemon flavor, or cherry flavor. So you get either lemon, citrus, or cherry flavored chalk. It's horrible. Okay, so you, and you, they're big tablets and you have to chew them up. So my kids hated them. So because of that, we would find calcium pills underneath the pillows of the couch. We would find them in corners. One day my dog came out from underneath the table going, <laughs> she didn't like it either. So, so we would find these calcium pills. So I had, to, I had to tell you that in order to go back to the story. So uh, my, my wife gets up, kisses me goodbye, and leaves, and I'm up, and I'm doing some things around the house, and I go into the bathroom, and I look in the bathroom, and I see somebody's taken an entire bottle of calcium and poured it into the toilet. And I thought, oh, no, who did that? I said, Matt, Josh, Charity, Faith, come down here. And uh, they all come running down the stairs. I said, I want to know, you know what this is? This is an empty bottle of calcium. I said, somebody poured this in the toilet. So I said, I want to know who did it. Matthew said, I didn't do it. Joshua said, I didn't do it this time. (laughs) And uh, Charity said, I didn't do it. And and, and, uh, they all said, maybe it was Faith. I said, Faith didn't do it. Faith's like a four-year-old blonde. She don't know what's going on. I said, okay, here's the deal. I said, here's the deal. 
You're not, no, because I, I was really shocked because normally when they get caught, they confess immediately, but nobody confessed. So I said, go upstairs. So they went upstairs. One hour, two hours, three hours goes by and nobody's confessed it. And I'm really disappointed. I'm thinking, what a, what a, why wouldn't they tell me? My wife comes in. She's been at this ladies activity. So what are you doing? She said, I forgot something. I had to come home real quick and pick something up. She said, where are the kids? I said, well, I said, I got to tell you what your children did. I said, uh, I said, they, I, I, I showed her, I said, somebody took this bottle of calcium and poured it out in the toilet. She said, oh, David. She said, I was cleaning out the cupboards. That's like three or four years old, I thought. I, I dumped it out. I said, you dumped out the calcium? She said, yes. Yeah. So I spanked her. No, I, I really, I, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. So I, I said, oh, wow. I've basically called my kids liars. I thought, man, that's terrible. So I yelled upstairs. I said, Matt, Josh, Charity, Faith, come down here. So they all came down. And um, I got down on my knees. And I looked at Matt. And I said, Matt, I want you to know something. I was wrong. Josh, I was wrong. Charity, I was wrong. Faith, I was wrong. I, you told me the truth, and I said you lied. And it was me. I should have, I should have trusted you. And I want to ask you to forgive me. You know what my kids said? Really? Yeah. And they hugged me. They said, can we watch the movie now? I said, yeah. And we had a party. It's all over. I just want you to know it's so important. Your children know that you make mistakes. And they want you to be real enough to admit when you've made mistakes. And that'll bond you together. That doesn't rip apart your authority. That, that heightens your, your authority in their eyes. So personally apologize when you've done something wrong. And then lastly, pursue your children's heart. Amen. Pursue your children's heart. Run after them. Let them know that they are number one priority. I tell people this. My number one priority in life is my relationship with God. That's a spiritual thing. That's the way it should be. If I'm right with God, I'll be right with other people. Number two, my, on earthly, my, my number two my, my number one relationship physically is with my wife. I'm, I'm going to make sure that I have a right relationship with her, humanly speaking. That's number one. For my wife and I, our number one priority is our children together. They don't come between us, but they're to us together. They are number one, and they need to know that. They need to know they're more important to you than anything else in the world. You need to love them unconditionally. If, you lo if they know that you love them and you care about them, they'll put up with, your, with the dumb things that you do as a parent. They'll put up with you as for the dumb things you do as a grandparent. And I've done a lot of those things. So I, I just want you to understand, they need to know that they are number one to you. That, and, and show that to them. Let them know that. Let them know that you'd give up anything for them. Somebody gave me this poem when Matthew and Joshua were very young. It says this, there are little eyes upon you and they're watching night and day. There are little ears that quickly take in everything you say. There are little hands all eager to do everything you do and a little boy who's dreaming of the day he'll be just like you. You're the little fellow's idol. You're the wisest of the wise. In his little mind about you, no suspicions ever rise. He believes in you devoutly, holds in all you say and do, he will say and do in your way when he grows up to be just like you. There's a wide-eyed little fella who believes you're always right and his ears are always open and he watches day and night. You're setting an example every day in all you do for the little boy who's waiting to grow up to be just like you. You're the example, Dad. Your role is so important. It's so important we provide a warm and loving home that we pray for our children daily and with them. It's so important that we play with them. It's so important that we personally apologize when we're wrong. And it's so important that we pursue their hearts. I want you to know this. God, our Father, loved you so much that he didn't want you to go to hell. 
He loved you. He pursued you. He became a man so he could die in your place and pay for your sin. And the only thing you need to do to get to heaven now is receive what he's done for you. Would you receive what your heavenly father has done for you today? If you've never done it, do it today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the privilege of sharing truth. Thank you for this wonderful uh, group of people here today. I pray, Father, you help us to take the truths that are here and apply them to their life. I pray if there's somebody here that's not saved, you'll save them right now, and I ask this in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I want to ask a question. Do you know for sure if you died right now, you'd go to heaven? Is there a time in your life you remember asking Jesus to give you eternal life? If that's you, would you slip up your hand and say, yeah, I've done that, I know I'm going to heaven. Thank you, you can put your hands down. Maybe you didn't raise your hand. Maybe you're hearing you say, preacher, I don't know that. I don't know I'm going to heaven. I can't remember a time I personally asked Jesus to give me eternal life. Well, I want you to know it's just that simple. You can right now ask Jesus to give you eternal life. He's a loving, heavenly Father who will come into your life if you'll just simply ask him. Maybe you'd say today, preacher, pray for me. You didn't raise your hand a minute ago, but you'd say, preacher, that's me. I don't know for sure I'm going to heaven, but I'd like to know that. I'm not going to ask you to do anything to embarrass yourself. I'd just like to pray with you and share with you what you can pray to receive Christ. You'd say, preacher, pray for me. I don't know I'm going to heaven, but I'd like to know that. Would you slip up your hand let me pray for you? Nobody's looking around but me, just me. I'd like to pray for you. Okay, I see that hand, and I'll pray for you, and I see that hand, and I'll pray for you. I don't know for sure if I died, I'd go to heaven, but I'd like to know that. Please pray for me. Anybody else? I don't know that. Father, I pray for those two. I saw two hands raised. I pray for those two. I pray, Father, that you would make it very clear that they can call on you and that they can be saved right now. I pray for anybody else in here that's never trusted you, that they'll pray today and receive you as Lord and Savior. Make it clear to them, and I ask this in Jesus' name. Heads are still bowed and eyes are still closed. I prayed for you. If you raised your hand, I want you to know that right where you're sitting, or even if you didn't raise your hand, God knows your heart. If you've never received Christ as your Savior, and you would like to do that right now, you can, bow, you can just say to Jesus with your head bowed, just whisper these words to him, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you are God. I believe that I'm a sinner. And I believe that you died and rose from the dead to pay for my sin. And right now, in the best way I know how, I call on you, and ask you to be my Lord and my Savior and my God. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Help me now to live for you. Heads are still bowed and eyes are still closed. Christian, I would ask you to do this. Dad, specifically, would you make a commitment to God right now? Just say, Lord, I want to make a commitment to pray for my children every single day and with them. I want to make a commitment to play with my children. I want to make a commitment to pursue my children's heart and to personally apologize when I do wrong. Make that commitment between you and God so God can bless your life. Father, thank you for the privilege of sharing your truth. Help us to apply it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching the Southern Hills YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we post a new video. And remember, we exist to make disciples for Jesus Christ. Have a great week. Bye.